Not again. My landlord to do. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Welcome, welcome to Naked Wines Rosé Masterclass Special. More of a rosé discussion back and forth and a chill out session than a masterclass, although we will go into the background of how it's made in different areas. But we have two rosé masters. That's the most important thing here. First up, Carlos Rodriguez, who you've known since the very beginning of Naked, probably 12 years you're probably with us, Carlos, I imagine. And you're in uh, Spain, currently based well, currently working out of Galicia, Northwest Spain, but otherwise making his wine in Rioja and, and, and around Spain. And then a huge welcome to our new winemaker, Benjamin Mai. Bienvenue, Benjamin, from Provence, Luberon. Thank you. Luberon, Luberon, but uh, you have experience in, in, in Provence as well as Luberon and actually experience making wine all over the world. So that's, that's our setup for this evening. And uh, we've got two wines, one from each of the winemakers. Uh, we've got Carlos's Trigales Rosé and Benjamin's recent pre-sample, actually, the Terra de Luberon. Uh, and I'm, I've tasted both of them, quality control. And it's, this is probably the hottest week of the year so far in the UK. So we will take a moment to talk about the weather because this is Britain and people like to talk about the weather. And um, so it's, um, we couldn't have timed, it was Rosé week last week, I think, and it's Provence Day, last Thursday of the month. Do, do, do you know, Benjamin, when is, when is Ro Provence Day? Is there a day at the end of the month? Uh, yes, the, the, uh, I think, I think because yesterday or today, today was the, the Rosé uh, uh, the the, um, the day of rosé for all over the world yeah. and in Provence in I think in the last of the week. Very good. So we are we are jam packed. It's a rosification rosé festival, and um, so we're going to just you know talk about the different wines that we have at Naked, but also the wines that you guys grew up drinking and tell us about how they're made and how they differ from one another. And uh, yeah, hopefully everyone's got their windows open or maybe you're sitting out in the garden and watching this on your phone. Uh, but bienvenue, welcome. And uh, please join the chat down below. Just tell us where you are, what you're up to. And we'll also, we also have a Q&A and maybe this might be the evening where the Q&A explodes with questions around how, why, what, where of how Rosé is made. So. Before we kick off, get chatting, Carlos, I really want to get chatting to you about your, your approach to, to Rosé and, and the history of Rosé in Spain and what, what, how that's changed. Dominique, I wonder, could you throw up, we're going to ask a poll, we're just going to get a read of the room, uh, well, a read of the audience, and ask everyone, how do you like your Rosé? Because obviously it differs in, greatly differs in style from around the world. You have the very, very pale, Provence, perhaps. You have a deeper style in wine regions in France, like uh, Tavel in, in the South Rhone. You also have that sort of white Zinfandel, that sweeter style of dark rosé from California. Navarra used to be a darker rosé, now it's lighter. So where is, what's your appetite for rosé? Let us know. Paler than a pale thing, plenty of pink, like turn it up, or somewhere in between. And I'm thinking, Benjamin, you're Provence or your Luberon rosé is paler, pale, pale. And then Carlos, I think you're somewhere, somewhere in between. So let us know if you can vote there and we're going to get the results up on the screen any minute and I will play it back for those who are on Facebook because I'm not sure if you can see it. Well, close, but somewhere in the middle, 44% of you said, but for taking a side, 41% say paler than the pale thing. Uh, versus the 15% of plenty of paint. Well, okay, good. We have a good read. We, we, we know how to play. I think, Carlos, you're playing it safest somewhere in the middle there. Yeah, I do. Something in the middle. <laughs> Something in the middle, yeah. But also, I just want to throw out a couple of info pieces for you all. There is, uh, it's a shout out to Philly the Pink. He's one of our archangels. And he started a Think Pink group on Naked Wines, as you may know, we've got a number of groups on Naked Wines website. You can join them on the top bar. It says community and group. And you have new wines and winemakers and various other naked novices. But there's a Think Pink group. And in there, they talk about all things pink. 
And uh, but it's great. It's recommendations and, and and suggestions, and you know, also food matching and so on. So I think my my dear colleague Simon might be pasting a link to that pink pink group in the chat room, so you'll be able to just sort of click through and see it there. So while everyone else is off looking at the think pink group, we can have a uh, we can start by tasting. Carlos, I'm going to start with you if that's cool. Yeah, can can we yeah. can we have a taste of your rosé because it is. Five past eight on Thursday, on Tuesday, the hottest day of the year. And um, yes, we need some juice in our glass. So, Carlos, Corito, first of all, maybe we just do a tasting of the wine. And then what I always enjoy listening to you, Carlos, is where you tell us about how the previous generation or generations used to drink rosé or red and, and, and things like that. You know, I, it, you always give a sort of an illustrative, imaginative, you know, figurative uh, description of the region where the wines come from. So maybe first of all, tell us what we should taste in the wine, and then we talk about rosé culture in in Rioja or wherever. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Ray. Very happy to be here for being here. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of color, as we said before, something in the middle, not as pale as Provence style not as dark as it was usual in Navarra years ago. Um, on the aromatic point of view, uh, considering that my rosé is 100% Tempranillo, uh, we get the typical balance between uh, the three to, three, three, three to three character and furry character with uh, red, uh, red uh, berries like uh, um, Green strawberries or not ripe, uh, not very ripe strawberries. That, yeah. that, can, that are the typical flavors we would expect. Um, in in the in the mouth, I think that um, it's it's a very balanced wine. Uh, you get the freshness that the acidity gives to the wine, uh, but we get also the sweetness that the wine has thanks to this. Uh, sweet uh, aromatic identity, you know. Um, what a particular character that Tempranillo gives to the rosé, it's a, a kind of, uh, some kind of structure. You know, it's, it's not a very, it's not a live rosé. It's a mm. quite, uh, it has a quite uh, intensity, body and volume. Uh, this, gives a, this, this gives the wine also an uh, interesting length. You know, it's, it's not the typical uh, rosé that you could uh, drink uh, very easy because they are thinner or lighter. It, it has a little bit more intense, intensity in, in my opinion. So you, when you're drinking rosé from Rioja or rosé from Tempranillo, you sort of know you're drinking Tempranillo. You know, you have a little bit of structure. It's still, I was looking at the comments on your wall today for this wine, Carlos, and um you managed to hit, you know, this perfect balance of it's dry, it has enough fruit, but not too fruity, not overly sweet, and, and it has good persistence. Now that's kind of a that's the kind of thing only a wine expert might talk about persistence, but it just means that actually you feel it, and and, and it goes on for for a little bit longer. And then the, and there's a home for others. I think of Stefano de Baz, Stefano de Blasi's um, blush, uh, Pinot Grigio blush from North Italy. And that is a crusher. That's just a knock it back, drink responsibly. But it's got just, it's light and soft and easy. But with yours, you have a little bit more of a frame, don't you? So you can actually appreciate different sensations. And would you say, Carlos, as they say in France, c'est plus gourmand. It's more, um, it, it's, it stands up, it's made for food a little bit more yeah, as well. Man, of that structure. Yeah. I, I understood you, the special gourmand. It's, it's, uh, I think that this is part of our culture in Spain. In general, not specifically talking about Russia, in general about wines. We, rel we relate wine with food in Spain. Uh, in some way, all our wines are gastronomic wines. They are wines that, uh, that even if we don't, uh, if, even if we try to make wine to drink itself without food, I think that being Spanish, the end being wines that they pair well with food. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You have a yeah. So what? So what? I mean, let, let's and we, we, we'll go back and then we'll catch up 
on the food. But I, I remember you talking to me about how people drink. They used to make rosé basically just because it was, you know, the heat and just something really easy going to drink in the evening out on the streets. And you have these um, carafe, poron, poron, what are they called? Poron, poron. poron. And I, I found an, an image of that. I'm just going to show people. I'm not sure if we have set up to share a screen, but <clears throat> here we go. Bear with me. You might see things you don't want to see on here. One sec. Uh, share. Boom, boom. Does that work? Yeah. So this yeah, is. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's the way. Google. These are not our images. So we thank Google for sharing these images with us. But so this is a Poiron and you, you hold it. Well, you hold it up and you just let it guzzle down your, your mouth. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's, uh, the idea is that it's uh, a carafe to share between the people, the friends, uh, the company who is drinking the wine. Uh, uh, but it's to, to, share, to share the garaf without sharing the virus. You know, uh, you, yeah. you don't touch the garaf with your mouth. Uh, in fact, uh, it's, it's a kind of artistic competition between neighbors uh, to show who is able to bring uh, higher, no, with uh, <laughs> with more distance between yes. the garaf and your mouth. Uh, a good thing uh, is also that this is supposedly to be done as the guy who is with the black uh, sweater, uh, holding it with the with the hand without touching the wine, so you are not warming the wine. Aha! Wow, I get it. I get it. I get it. So it's to to keep the wine cool and fresh, hold it up, and then pass it around to your neighbor. It's it's a it's a nice social event without be you know yeah. actually it's, it's it's made for coronavirus you know you yeah. can just have drinks on the street but no one catches the virus let's it, bring it back is there for, for for us in Spain uh, one is is very uh, deep in our culture um, uh, to use the Peron was a way of sharing wine with neighbors or with friends. So, for example, probably the first memory I have about wine uh, when I was a child is to, to I remember my grandfather uh, in on the street with my neighbors uh, sharing a poron of rosé uh, before uh, at evening before before dinner. You know when it was uh, almost sunset and we, you, you started to have some fresh air it was a moment for sharing uh, you know a normal day with the neighbors you know, for chatting talking uh, you know times without internet without social networks but um, time with where you used to have a parole every evening with your neighbors and this is the that probably the first memory i have about wine is my grandfather doing it that Many times they, they used to do it even with a little bit of lemonade or soda, you know, if, 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 if this was more or less depending the quantity they wanted to drink. If they wanted to drink more quantity, they used to add a little bit of lemonade for refreshing more and not get it drunk so quick because the grandma was, was at home waiting, waiting them. <laughs> yeah. No, that is absolutely fantastic. It's beautiful. Um, it's nice to think back to that time of, yeah, just the basic, the authenticity, and the, you know, the the simplicity of sharing wine, which is what why we're all in this, you know, because what we want to do is just enjoy. It's such a beautiful cultural piece. But um, Carlos, what we will what we'll do? I know that you've got plenty more to share about your wine, and I want to come back on food as well. But uh, Benjamin, can we talk about your delicious? I think it's ninety six percent rated Terra de Luberon, which was a, a free sample recently and uh, tell us first of all where, where are you where are you based where are you calling us from now or where, where are we calling you i, I call you from uh, i have in luberon we near uh, not far away from exam provence um, it's very important here because you have in the rosé culture um, uh, south of france south of france provence uh, born uh, the culture about uh, rosé in um, taking rosé like red wine um, uh, um, because um, uh, I born in this region when my first remember was taking rosé on the beach. You understand what I mean? Yeah. That everybody taking rosé. 
I never take, I tasting, my first tasting was rosé, you understand? It yeah. not was red wine or white wine, no, it was rosé. People thinking rosé, people drinking rosé, every time, every moment. We have so many uh, different choice of rosé that for the aperitif, for the um, dinner, or sometimes just to drinking wine, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and first remember, it was uh, um, go with friends on the beach in the south of France. And what we do, we take a bottle of rosé, very, very fresh. And everybody taking rosé because it's a wine for the summer, but uh, that's natural, you know? It's not, it's like identity rosé in Provence is normal. Um, uh, obviously, uh, actually, with my my comeback in, in, in South of France after 12 years uh, in Chile and different region, um, I send a, 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 a good uh, thinking about my friend Luca. You know Luca, winemaker? Because yeah. thanks, 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 Luca, I'm here with you. Um, because it's a small world, you know, of winemaking. And I was one of the first winemakers in Chile to making a, a rosé style from Carmen Air. You understand? Yeah. Because it was my ADN. It is a culture, you know. I can't to spend my time all the time to drinking rosé is natural. And actually, we were we we producing eighty percent rosé. You know what I mean? Yeah. Exactly. I make seven, uh, six or seven different rosé in my in my, in my uh, portfolio. And um, wh why Luberon? Because we have pioneer. I, what I mean to do. Provence today is very close. Many people invest in Provence. The land is very expensive. And we decided when I back to Provence with Luca, because I make rosé with him in South of France, um, to try in looking for new terroir, new area, geographic, that mean very interesting for the same grape variety that we use in Provence as principally uh, Syrah, Grenache, and white grape variety, we use uh, Vermentino, white uh, Grenache, and Uni Blanc. Why the reason? Because it's part of this culture of rosé, or looking for the harmony. And all the time in rosé uh, industry in south of France, we have a culture of co fermenting white grape with red grape. That's one part of the story of the rosé modernity of uh, industry. Um, um, uh, we have actually a first unique center in the world of rosé uh, research that they give a lot of information for all the winemakers in the region. Mm -hmm. That's right. the reason why we have always have to do the new tendency, the new experimentation, how, how to progress in this story of rosé because of course, we have uh, we, we, I born in Rosé and we always trying something that the customer has been uh, enjoying, but they can to take Rosé for all the moments. That's very important. And for me, it's my culture. I take Rosé every time. This <laughs> is, is natural. I've been in Chile making different great variety, but I'm back to France, south of France to making Rosé, you know? Yeah. And I really appreciate and thanks for your angel to, to have this, uh, um, um, uh, to give the, all this uh, uh, good uh, um, uh, uh, note. And, but we work, we work all together with us to make the best and uh, to trying to make, a pers of course, personality. That's the reason why two years ago, we buy a vineyard here. We have a vineyard between, we have uh, around um, uh, uh, less, uh, less one kilometer of Provence. We have exactly the same orientation of the rosé uh, vineyard in Provence. Of course, exactly the same grape plant. Uh, we have the vineyard in, in between the vineyard. We have Syrah, Grenache, and Vermentino. That's what we want to do to find something very similar to make to have the material to make great rosé. Mm -hmm. And of course, a lot of working with winery with the technology because they need a lot of time in the in the in the winery uh, to taking the right color the white grape uh, percentage of grape to keep this kind of flavor very fresh freshness style but not too too much excessive 
in, uh, in, in, in the style of uh, uh, grapefruit or something like that, mm. the, the perfect balance with the acidity. We have 300 meters under the level of the sea, we have a lot of freshness, the Alp mountain not far away, and this atmosphere gives a long maduration of this grape and the freshness we try to keep in the rosé we find here. And I think the value is the best place to make rosé on this Provence style. Well, you heard it here first. Thank you, Benjamin. That's a beautiful picture of, of where you are and, and why how it differs from next door. Do you have a glass with you there? Can, can we taste your wine with you? And maybe tell people about what, what you course. taste and what you look for, what you try to achieve in, in your wine? I've of got course. a glass. Of course. Well, um, the, this rosé is made a little bit in the space, in the spirit of grapefruit, um, tropical nuts, a little bit uh, uh, berries, uh, that's very important. Uh, the color is very pale, like uh, pale, uh, a little bit uh, salmon and uh, real pale. Of course, it, we, we, we're looking for this balance about not excessive of uh, not of orange. Um, I just want to show you something very unique. Is my, is help me when we working, we have uh, established the center of rosé, a different panel of color. Oh, fantastic. And yes, this, yes, we sure. work, all the winemaker working with kind of uh, like a painter because we designed the rosé for the color first. That's very, very important in, in the culture of rosé in Provence. Or the winemaker have this instrument. Can, of can course, show, it's more delicious. Can you show? It? Can you show us a couple of the panels, the pages? Yes, of course. And Do you see? Um, this is a color that we are working. Actually, we had more with um, lychee and a pearl color, lychee and sa and and just salmon. A higher, Benjamin. Just a little higher, please. Like your face, please. Yeah. Like the okay. yeah 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 perfect perfect like yeah good this okay. is really interesting things that winemaker use for the to design the color because yeah. one first things we thinking is the color because of course we have in Provence and in Provence you don't have to make any things people have exigence and um, we need to apply some things that make a little bit in the move of uh, all the center of research. And that's the reason why we had white grape in the red grape in co-fermenting that they keep this kind of flavor very clear, very uh, not very excessive, you know. And with this, we determinate the, what the color we want to work. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. I love it. And so, uh, and do you discuss it? I assume each Pantone has a name and then you say this wine, like uh, you have two wines with us. Yes, this of wine course. Will be number twenty-four color. Exactly. Exactly. The the rose the the first rose you tasting the Deterra Luberon is yeah. much a little bit for note of um, uh, lychee and some salmon color. Yeah. yeah. But the other the other rose is Terre des Hospitaliers is more Grenache and is more peach color. You understand ah, yes, that, that that's two time of color because two different brand, two different blend of grape variety. The Terra is more Syrah style, is more Provence. The the Terre des Hospitaliers more Grenache is a little bit more a touch of orange style like peach, and it's and another determination of color. All born like this, you know. That's very yeah. interesting, no? Yeah, it's great. I yes. love it. I'm, I'm sure we, we, we're watch. always working like this, and that's very interesting to have three, four, five different rosé for five different number of color different. And of course, I, I now give you the description of uh, organoleptic description for the noise. Yes, please. please. That I give you that something very more grapefruit, a, 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 a touch of tropical, yeah. uh, but very intense, but not excessive that refresh because of course it's a rosé to take in with good weather, but of course for food, very fresh you take in aperitif, but with food is perfect with Asian food or something very lighter or sometimes like um, a fish, very uh, uh, grilled fish, perfect. In summer that the temperature is very higher, it's perfect. In mm. mouth, 
you have the freshness, you, you, you find the fruits, but they have crispy, you have a good acidity, a long balance, and that we, we want to do. That's the reason why we select vineyard of 300 meters under the level of the sea to keep the acidity. And plus the secret had the white grape, the white red refresh my blend. And yeah. they refresh all the, 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 the I retake the acidity with, uh, uh, with the white grape variety because we take the Greek variety from Udi Blanc Vermentine a little bit more uh, uh, earliest, and they keep all the freshness we need with the Sierra and the Grenache base. And I can feel it, it has, yeah, it has this sort of length and you can still feel it on your palate. It's great, great vibrancy that you say, like from the white grape. It's a really delicious wine and people are absolutely loving it. I did have a, a collection of notes from the page, but people are basically saying it's just, just the right balance of some red currant fruit, some freshness, nice and pale. So you've you've absolutely knocked it out of the park. So thank you for that. And thank you for your free sample to all the angels. Uh, that was a, a month or two ago. Carlito, amigo, can we go back and talk a little bit about um, maybe some of the food that you can be, because we, most people that join us here, they're first and foremost wine lovers but they, they come with food. Humans, we need it. We eat it. I eat personally food every day. So can you tell us about how you might match your Trigales Rosé with, with, with some of the food there, whether it's tapas or, or various dishes? Yes. It, um, in terms of food, I think I agree with Benjamin that probably in my opinion, Asian food, uh, first perfectly with, with Rosé and also with my Rosé. Uh, fresh food, uh, light food, oh, easy food, typical Maybe food that you can, have, you can have during summer or that you have uh, been in the garden or small bites, uh, something easy uh, to eat. Uh, Rosé doesn't need <clears throat> any special food to, to enjoy with. Uh, it, it doesn't have the complexity of big red. Uh, Rosé is a wine that is easier to understand uh, easier to pair with food. Um, in my opinion, uh, if you let me talking about uh, what in, what for me personally is the, the best pairing for wine, the best pairing for wine is not food, it's a good company. So uh, you can have the wine with the food you want, or whatever you want, but with the right people, with the people that you enjoy sharing your time with them, people that you love. Uh, that's for me, that's the most beautiful pain for wine. Absolutely. I completely agree. I, I did a, a tasting exam um, two, eight or nine years ago. No, it wasn't more than that. 2012, whenever that was. A, a, a while ago. And um, it was a blind tasting. It was an exam. And in it, I tasted, actually, it was a pink. It was a rosé moscato. Very popular at the time. And it asked for, uh, I think it was commercial position. So where, where, where should this be served or how would it be best appreciated? And I said, at a music festival where the music is more important than the wine. <laughs> so basically when the music and the company is more important than the wine. And that's it sometimes. I, I think we've got two fantastic rosés here, really well made by talented winemakers. And of course it goes fantastic with food, but really when the sun is out and even if the sun is not out, it's just about kicking back and appreciating the company that we have. And we didn't realize how much we appreciated that company um, until the last year happened that we all couldn't be with each other. So now that we can safely and whatever the regulations are, it, that's a great thing for Rosé and for wine in general and food. Everything's good. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do now. For everyone at home, I'm going to share with you, unplug this, I'm going to share with you some of the wines that I've been tasting this week and uh, to give you an insight of what's coming onto the site imminently, he pronounces just about. Okay, balance. All right, let's go. So as those of you who tune in regularly will know, um, I have been working from home as, as most of the planet and uh, samples are sent to me and my colleague Toby <clears throat> to taste and to ensure that they're good to go, whether they are just before they go into the bottle or just after they have been bottled, or in my case now today, 
everything that has arrived into our warehouse and just needs one final check and a final sign off to make sure it's top, top quality before we release it to you so that everything that you buy, you are assured of quality. So I'm going, I, I, I tasted lots and I'm going to just highlight da, 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 five or six quickly. So this is uh, Paolo Secchetto's new, brand new, it is, um, Col de Lucia Prosecco Rosé. It wouldn't be a rosé session if we didn't talk about Prosecco Rosé, which is actually new, new to the area that they're allowed to make Prosecco Rosé like this, or call it rosé when it's, um, or call it Prosecco when it is rosé. So that is delicious. It's, it's dry, but it still has the sort of, you know, that easy appeal that Paolo's Prosecco, white Prosecco that he makes. So anyway, if, if you like rosé, don't hesitate and, and add that to basket. All these will be live in about 24 hours, 48 hours, okay, on the site. Then I think I probably would have talked about this before in the past, probably when I tasted it first, but this is a new wine from Katie Jones, the Petit Train Vermentino. Vermentino, uh, Benjamin, not far from you. I mean, how, do, do you use Vermentino in your winemaking? Yes, of course, a lot of. Yeah. It's, it's we, we, we make a white too, a white with a white Grenache that's very, very interesting. But Vermentino is based, very based in the rosé. Yeah. This rosé de Terra has been a, a, a percentage of 12% of Vermentino. That's really, really nice grape. I love this grape. It's a fantastic grape. It's one of the, it's, um, I don't know, it has a, a pithy when we talk about like a, a pear where you bite into it and you have a little bit of the skin and a little bit ripe underneath that that texture but it's refreshing and crisp and good acid get good you know good freshness and it, anyway that's an absolutely crackerjack wine i think it's going to be 7.99 or, or thereabouts carlito amigo we have your albarino and and i'm not just sharing it because you're on here tonight but i tasted many many whites as you can see there but this is absolutely beautiful as as i think the previous vintage was as well and i think we're above 90% BIA, but Carlos, your Albarino is, is beautiful. Then Thank you. Three, three reds, and coincidentally, they're all Spanish, not intended, but um, I only noticed that when I was lining them up. But this is from David Sejas, uh, Garnacha. And I'm showing this because it's a hot, e well, a warm evening. And I tasted it and it was oh, dangerously gluggable, drinkable. It's the kind of wine Excuse me, and I did this, Benjamin, with Luca's wine, Sabbatico from Chile. Yeah. I chilled it for 30 minutes, and I never really do that because the weather is never really hot. But uh, I chilled this Sabbatico for 30 minutes last night or the night before, and it's oh, so tasty. It's just all red berries, strawberries, red currants, raspberries. And this is the same, but actually at a fraction of the price. I think this is about seven, nine, eight ninety nine. But when this goes live in a day or two, I really encourage you to, to, to just grab a bottle, chill it. I think it, gets, I think it rains on Thursday, but you know, it'll, it'll balance out. We've got a long summer ahead of us and an Indian summer. And then two more wines. This is from Jorge, who makes Casillo Catadao Gran Reserva, but this is his Tinto. And I have to tell you, there is a lot of wine in this. It's very, very well made, smooth. This is $7.99, I think. And I should know. I mean, I do know, but I just keep forgetting. And it's, um, it's got the freshness, the red berry fruit of Tempranillo, but then it goes all rounded, a nice little bit of oak on it and smooth. So it's an excellent value wine. And then finally, one of the best wines I've tasted this year. This is Hacienda Don Hernan. Uh, it's Grand Reserva Rioja 2001. It's a 20 year old wine. Let me pour a glass. Uh, actually, what I wanted to do is pour a glass of this, just to, of the Garnacha, just to show you this light light red color can you see that in a good enough light so anyway it's just really strawberry fruit easy drinking chuck that and pour this 20 year old brown reserve rioja and look at the depth and color of this wine and you don't even have the browning on the hue and it is honestly one of the best looking wines I've, and tasting wines i've had this year it's got you have the good complex evolution of the oak but the palate is so fresh. It's so intense and, and, and long. It's a beautiful wine. So that's in the Fine Wine Club in June, this one, which will be going out hopefully maybe the 25th of June or else the following week. And that is the Fine Wine Club is where we put every quarter six different wines from different winemakers, uh, usually uh, typically 
uh, exclusive to that case. So you, you get it first. And that 20 year old Gran Reserva from Rodolfo Bastida is amazing. And that's going in the case as well, along with a couple of other great ones. In fact, along with our first ever rosé. Uh, this one is Provence and it's from, um, uh, the name is Gran, uh, Chateau Saint Hilaire, excuse me, uh, our Provence, uh, their uh, Provence producer there. So for the first time ever, the Fine Wine Club will have a top, top rosé in there so it is showing our commission and our, our compassion towards uh rosé in general so bon, uh, we, we're gonna we, we have some questions and answers uh to 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 address there in the q a section but what i wanted to do is introduce everyone who's tuning in um i want to introduce everyone to a, a couple of there's three wines i want to tell you about and there's one book i want to tell you about if you really are a die hard um, rosé lover. There's a, a book by a master of wine called Elizabeth Gabay. Uh, she's British, lives in the south of France, and it's called Rosé, Understanding the Rosé Revolution. I think it's along those lines. Excuse me if I've got that wrong, but it is that. I, I have it, I bought it as soon as it came out, and it is packed up in boxes moving between our offices, but that's the kind, it's a beautiful looking book, but it, it just, it's a nice, yeah, I guess you call it a coffee table book where you can have a look and get a bit more of an insight. It, it's, it's educational in terms of how the different rosés are made. But then it also tells you about the different regions that make rosé all over the world. You have Ciretto from Italy. You've got the Tavel. We must never forget Sancerre rosé, which I think is really one of, one of the greater rosés of the world. The texture you get from the Pinot Noir always sells out and make it wines. And then, of course, there's Champagne rosé, English sparkling wine rosé which is knocking it out of the park so that's a great book uh, I, which i recommend and the other piece i wanted to say as part of the benchmarking process that we do at naked so just very quickly when you go onto any wines page you will see the angel price and above that you see the market price and the market price is what tells you we have tasted this wine against a wine of similar quality that you would get out in the market from another supermarket, retailer, whoever. And the saving is what you actually get when you buy it from Naked, but you're getting the same standard. And that's thanks to the model. But in doing this process to ensure we taste, taste, taste against the different wines in the market, one wine particularly popped up when we first started doing this July 2018 and last year and this year is Virgil Jolie's Rosé. It's a Van Pay Doc, Benjamin, and it's it's just so delicious. It's so good. It always absolutely nails everything. We actually tasted it against Brangelina, you know, uh, Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. They had, is it uh, Miravel, I think, Chateau Miravel uh, in, in Provence, which costs $14.99 or $15.99 or something like that. And we tasted it against this one blind, amongst other wines. Anyway, it's just an awesome wine. So whatever you do, add that to basket. Two others, again, Spain is Rafa and Nuria, who we helped out in the COVID fund. Uh, they are in Terra Alta, which is outside of Barcelona. And their, their rosé, uh, which is already live on the site, and I think my dearest colleague, Simon, is going to post the link to that page, but do yourself a favour and buy that rosé because, or, or, you know, check it out. And this isn't a, a hard sell. I just want to share some of the goodness, but that is really an astounding, outstanding rosé. And then finally also from the same area, coincidentally, is Frank Massar, his Cava Rosé, just to put it on the radar. I'd be remiss of me not to mention a Cava Rosé. But Benjamin, I think we, we got in touch or you were in touch with us last year around the time of the COVID rescue fund. And we, we included you in a, in a case and so you, you, and your wine was very popular. You sent us, you sent Eamon and I samples and actually we were spoiled. We were very lucky for the, the samples that you sent because the quality was so good. Can you tell us a little bit maybe about the difficulty, the challenge that you had around this time last year when restaurants had closed and you know you were getting going? Can you tell us about that and, and how yes. things changed? Well, we, we have a young company, you understand? We just starting two years ago, I started my own company from my cousin uh, uh, five, uh, five years ago, but we starting with the vineyard two years ago, just before the crisis of COVID. 
and has been very, very difficult. And I think um, I'm very, very lucky to find uh, Naked Wine because it was a really great for us to, to help the, 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 the dynamic and the creativity of winemaker. And of course, all the angel has been participated at helping this, our project because this year we're planting five hectares more. Uh, we have all the vineyard is a sustainable vineyard. Um, our wine is vegan. We not had anything just very carefully about the sulfur because we want to really, really always um, some things for your customer have the best and have the, 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 some things unique. And of course, the participation of Naked in our project has been really important. Actually, uh, we're growing thank, thanks to you, thanks to project our project with you. And uh, um, we're glad to, to, to have a very good uh, the customer. And your angel has been very careful about us. And of course, I invite everybody to come to South of France in Luberon because, of course, we will be very happy to receive you. And I'm very small, a lovely vineyard with a wonderful warehouse. And uh, of course, this part of Rosé, you know, share passion, share passion of winemaker. And of course, uh, I, I, I appreciate um, Angel has been uh, uh, like Angel, you know, yes. about, uh, about us. That's very great. Thank you so much. No, that's wonderful to hear. I mean, I actually wasn't aware that you were as young a company as two years and then for something like this just to hit. But fortunately, yeah, good. Great that angels were able to jump in and, and support. But, you know, with all of these things, uh, the wine has to be good as well. We care a lot about people in our industry, but we have to ensure the wine is good. And your wine, the Domaine de Terre des de, de Hospitaliers, is uh, was 97% rated. I mean, easily the highest rated rosé ever. And, um, and, it's, and it's great. And you were able to thank Angels with this free sample of the Terra Lubro. So um, it, was, it was a worthwhile experience for, for all of us. So, and, and lastly, I would just want to ask you, Benjamin, and then we're going to take some questions and we're going to wrap up probably around nine o'clock and 15 minutes. But can you just give us a picture Again, you, you mentioned Lubron, you're, you're one kilometer from the Provence border. But, you know, is there is the, is the soil and the temperature the same or is, is there much, you know, what, what makes Lubron equally special, equally valuable? Yes, I think Luberon, we, we actually with warming global, global warming, we're looking for freshness, we're looking for something a little bit more late, uh, late madura maduration, mm. but we're looking for, of course, the same grape because, of course, the king of rosé in south of France, of course, is always Grenache, the, the Syrah, and uh, the, 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 the soil is calcareous soil, um, that very reactive, really re mineral. And Luberon is between two sides, uh, sides of Provence, sides of Rhone, uh, influence about Alpes mountain. We have some influence of the um, Mediterranean Sea because not far away, but yeah. we have altitude. And that's very interesting for our looking for something more fresh, low alcoholic wine that's very very important that not have too much alcohol too much temperature and of course to benefit the vineyard benefits uh, here have exactly all the condition and you don't have very dry you have uh, is not very dry you have a, a sufficient uh, rain to preserve the, the the freshness in the wine that's one of the reasons we're looking for this place because it was the, 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 the place that everybody speak inside the winemaker about the new place to be here. And of course, with the experiences I've been in Chile, the, the, the learning a little bit to not looking for, uh, always uh, looking for something different, looking for new terroir. Well, has been a real opportunity yeah. to be here. Yeah, awesome. Well, well, we're lucky that we came across each other. And that's you have to invest. You have to work on these things. And uh, well, it, we are where we are. Thank you. So why don't we take some uh, questions? And so we have the Q and A section here. Uh, the first question is from Peter. 
what does the color say about the taste? Carlos, I would refer to you because you've you've done the full spectrum of colors, I think. You, you've done magnums as well for us. And so what do you think or how would you best describe what the color says about the taste? It's not, a, it's not an easy question. Um, Coral is, uh, it indicates uh, in some way <clears throat> the level of maceration between the juice and the skins. Uh, considering that most of the flavors uh, are aromatic compounds that are in the skins, it should be supposed that high coral uh, should mean deeper, uh, more intense flavors and uh, aromatic intensity. But uh, <clears throat> in Rosem, we need to pay attention that uh, the balance of the wine in general, the full balance of the wine in terms of uh, aroma, taste, and all, all the uh, different compounds that are involved in this general balance, uh, they are in a lower level than uh, uh, comparing with a red wine. So, uh, uh, this balance is more fragile in some world, in some world. Okay. So uh, I, to end after saying all these things that <laughs> you didn't understood, right? <laughs> after all this, it's impossible to answer in a fixed rule to that question. This depends of the uh, terroir condition, weather conditions, altitude, Great variety and wine making technology. So, uh, I, on the consumer point of view, I will say to you on this question: Don't pay attention uh, to any relation in terms of color and taste. Um, just experiment yourself tasting the wine. So, mm. and I, I think perhaps you could say because, well, because the question was was raised, it, it, it does mean that people are sort of seeking out a bit of a steer because when you're certainly you're buying online or even in a shop, you can't taste the wine. Well, it's in some shops you can, but color does give a bit of an indicator. And I think because there was an era of uh, naming a brand Gallo White Zinfandel, which was pinker than a pink thing, uh, it was you know it was, and it was sweet. You know, it was an off dry, it was a sweetened wine. And maybe that came in and went out of favor and it was dark. So I think then, and Provence has always been, I think, you know, dry, restrained, red currants, sort of held back style. And it's been pale. Now it's just gotten paler and paler. So I would say, you know, if you're looking for dry and not exuberance and, and not sweetness, pale is probably the way to go. Whether whether a, a rosé that a, a has a bit more depth and color to it is actually sweet or not, then on naked wines you can read the comments, and they'll tell you the cut your your cut you know your peers around the country will tell you if it, if they think it's sweet or not. For example, Thomas mm -hmm. Buendia from La Mancha, his is I probably reckon his is our, our deepest rosé, but it's not deep. It's like medium pink, and it's dry, but it's medium pink. So in, in that spectrum, his goes more like that. So uh, as always, sorry. read the comments. Right, just for one appreciation, I would like to introduce uh, yeah. in the conversation. Uh, when, we, when we talk about white or about red, uh, we don't uh, usually talk about white in general or red in general. Uh, we talk about different grape varieties, different producing regions, different wine making methods. Uh, it's not the same, an, an oak bread or an IG bread. So uh, I, I think that with Rosé, we, we must consider the same situation. Uh, Rosé uh, has a lot of difference depending uh, region, uh, wine making methods, their varieties. So I think it's uh, what you are doing in Naked Wine, uh, right? it's a very interesting uh, point of view about Rosé, because the viability of Rosé wines that consumer our angels we can choose and taste is so big that uh, we are showing all the difference between uh, different varieties and different regions. And this is, uh, 
I, I think, in my opinion, it's something that uh, I appreciate. Uh, I would like to say you thank you for doing it because it's uh, it's, it's in some way helping uh, our, uh, helping wine consumers to be more open-minded uh, in the point of view of rosé wines. Hmm. Good. Well, and that's what the group is. Think Pink in the the, the Naked Wines community group and. Um, there you can go and unleash all your inner pink abilities. Um, so we continue with uh, just wondering, just wondering as there seems to be this from Gary. Thanks. Just wondering as there seems to be less availability of vegan white and rosé than red wines. If your wines are vegan or not, what influences your decision on the products you use to clarify the wine? That's a big question, Gary. Um, Benjamin, vous avez compris? Yes, of course. Just surprised. No, it's good. Yeah. Uh, I think the vegan for me it was a choice of complication of clarify the wine. Of course, actually we don't use any product like casein from eggs or gelatin from pork. We use just a vegetable. Uh, um, uh, do call? Uh, vegetable um, uh, uh, clarify clarify and it's more complex of course to keep the low color because we don't uh, we have not but we like the challenge you know and more people ask me they have um, sensibility or they have allergy and we we want more purists you understand what I mean want to want the purists because uh, I, I I'm um, to to join to Carlos Actually, I manage my vineyard for make rosé wine 100%, one part of my vineyard. All the vineyard is managing for make rosé. You understand? We make, a, the, you, you cultivate the vine. We, we have a process in the vineyard just to make rosé. That's crazy because we, we try attention about all the detail because it's really, it's the, the vineyard when we decided to make rosé, not like this grape, is we, we make red and, for example, some part of the, the grape go to make rosé. Some, some people make like this. Yeah. No, we just 100% of the vineyard go to make rosé. And we have different process of vinification to make different rosé. We have maceration of uh, cold maceration for stabulation in cold temperature. Some wine is not cold temperature. We not have different uh, ty type of temperature of fermenting. Some wine is fermenting a little bit more higher. Some wine, wine is fermenting very cold temperature, like Sauvignon Blanc style. And that's very interesting for, 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 for this challenge to making different rosé in the same vineyard. But all the process I've been working like this and vegan has had something more guaranteeing the consumer because all the vineyard we have a certified HV1 is like haute valor environmental that's really important for me. We not use herbicides in the vineyard and I think it was a, a challenge to add uh, more some things for the customer to, to guarantee of the quality of the product. Yeah, that's lovely. I, I think I would describe you as a purist, a, a rosé purist, Benjamin, but it's it's great. Thank you. Wide breathing, uh, great breath in your answer. Um, we have another question here from M. Norris. How come so much good rosé comes from France? Carlos, I'll let you answer that. <laughs> I, I don't agree with the, <laughs> with the main with the main part of the question. Uh, rosé wines uh, are made amazing in around over the world. Uh, what probably happens is that uh, the possibilities that uh, you can uh, get in the market for getting rosé wines from France are much bigger than any other places in the world mm. uh, that's uh, an aspect that we pay attention we must pay attention to it uh, Provence is the is the Roche region uh, for for the wine market but uh, to say the truth uh, I think that Benjamin said a very important thing uh, they cultivate the vineyard exclusively 
to produce rosec. And that's something that uh, we don't do eat in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife, my, my wine, for example, everybody knows where the grapes came from. I think that I'm not going to go to jail if I say here that the grapes came from Rioja. Um, we uh, we rack uh, around 10% of the tanks to concentrate the Tempranillo, so to make a better red. Uh, we This uh, juice uh, we use for making Rosé. Uh, this is in general work, so not 100% on that, on that way. But uh, we use uh, a level of quality grapes that uh, is the same quality that you could have in that uh, 2001 Grand Reserve, <laughs> for example. Mm. So uh, there are different, different ways to work. But uh, I agree uh, that uh, it's very important what Benjamin said, that uh, they cultivate the vineyard since the beginning thinking to make it rosé. Yeah, I think it, that's a fair comment, uh, Carlos. It comes back to what's the objective? What are you out to do? And Carlos, you make some of the best Rioja we have. It's absolutely amazing. And and the other reds you make around Spain for us. And the perhaps the method of making these outstanding reds also enables you to make a rosé, which you could look at as a byproduct of the great quality or you the way you make this, it's equally delicious. So basically, just to tell people like at home, the grapes go into the crusher, they're all in there together. They sit there for what, about eight hours and then you just open the tank and let some of the juice the run out. So remember in a red grape, the center of a red grape, like if you buy in a market or a supermarket or wherever, you bite into a black grape, red grape, it's white on the inside. But when you squeeze it together and you let the black or red skin sit with the white juice, the color of the juice starts to starts to change. It's a dye. And it's essentially what is happening with wine making. You crush it, but before it gets enough time to dye the inner white juice, you drain off the white juice, which has now got a little bit of a pink color, and you take that away. And then you're left with a smaller ratio, greater ratio of grapes to the juice. So you get more of the skin going into the juice that remains. You get a deeper, bolder, darker wine and you make outstanding wine like Carlos does. So, whereas in your case, Benjamin, you start in the viticulture, in the vineyard and you go, this is what we're here to do. We're only gonna make rosé, we're gonna make rosé like this. And I think that, you know, in summary of this evening, it's, it's been amazing having you both, both of you masters on here is just to show you know, the raison d'etre, the, what, what is the purpose of the rosé? Well, it essentially is to drink it and enjoy it <laughs> with friends. But how it came to be, some case, like yours, Benjamin, starts in the vineyard and with you, Carlos, it enables you to make great, refreshing, the kind of wine that you drink on the street with your grandparents on a hot evening, whilst you make great red wines. And um, that's a good, it's a nice differentiation, nice positioning of rosé in yeah. the world. Uh, I would like to take the wine from Carlos. I'm really happy to taste Rioja and I know, but, um, and I invite Carlos to come to here because it's very interesting that we change, like Luca, for example, is uh, we change a lot of, and Luca is coming because he has vineyard in, in, in Spain too. And we're working together. We're making rosé for another market in the US, you know, and they're interesting to, to with um, uh, things, thanks to Naked, that winemaker not have just a relationship to making wine to sell, but to, to learn each other. Why you do that? Why I do that? And try to learn because I'm very interesting and I admire the region when you come from, uh, Carlos. Uh, obviously, I'm working in Chile, I'm working in Australia, I'm working in different countries all over the world, I'm working in Bordeaux. I know different culture of wine or making red wine and I'm always uh, interesting to learn and to making different part of the, the wine is the difference. Carlos make, I think, a beautiful rosé and I would like to try this rosé. And I think this part is very different style and that's the customer have the choice 
how to have different rosé, rosé from Provence style, more rosé, focused in rosé. Carlos, like more saigné in, in, sorry, yeah, but in the spirit, but more grow, more powerful rosé. But I think all the rosé have the moment to drink, you know, even if the wine is good, you understand, and making with love and with a good um, uh, 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 way that was drinkable wine. And of course you have here Hooray to select and to always to be too careful about the quality. And that's amazing. I love that. Yeah, I, I think that that's a nice summary. And it is not about uh, myself or Toby who I work alongside with and Matt, but just looking on the Naked Wines page now and you can have a look, you search for Rosé. I, I just don't remember a time when the ratings were so high and so strong. The love was so strong and the quality was so good for Rosé and Naked. And I think that comes from just slowing down and, you know, finding the right winemaker, understanding what they do. And I'm, I'm very, very, very proud of what we have uh, and, and those we have. And Carlos, you know, we've been talking Rosé for a long time. <laughs> you know, you've yeah. know, been talking Rosé since 2013. And um, and it's it's absolutely beautiful. And the rating, you know, it's just it's just gone live, so you can't see the rating on your wine yet. But um, well, look, I tell you, it's it's great. Make rosé great again. Sorry, an inappropriate uh, reference. But we um, we've run out of time. Tina, one of our archangels, has said it would be interesting to do a poll to see who drinks rosé all year round or just in summer. And it's all year round for her. Perhaps that's a conversation that could be picked up on the Think Pink group. And that's where people can sort of share their thoughts, whether you drink rosé all year round or not, whether rosé is your favourite thing, just to dip in and out of that group, just to get a feeling of, you know, because it is undoubtedly a, a, a very, very popular and high quality wine now. And, and also, and so Benjamin, welcome to the family. We're glad you're here. Thank Carlito, you. thank you for flying the flag and also for taking the time. I know you've been busy working over in uh, Galicia today and this week. And thank you everyone for joining us um, mid rose season. But uh, and enjoy the rest of this beautiful weather. Drink responsibly, but gosh, these roses are tasty. So get involved. Thank you everyone. Have a great evening. Cheers. Cheers. À bientôt. Merci. Thank you very much.